Welcome back, everybody, to the Thrivers Free Podcast, Mastering the Art of Thriving at Life, where we talk about creating change in our lives and the world around us. I'm your host, Coach 2Js, a.k.a. Jeremy Jones, and I did nail that intro. You fucking time. nailed it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my co-host is Gigi. Say hi, Gigi. Hi. So um, today we're going to talk about um, uh, habit stacking, which is something that I've used in the past and something that I read about recently from James Clear's website. He wrote the book Atomic Habits. It's a really great book. I highly recommend it. And, um, and then we're, so it's, it's basically how do we, how do we uh, uh, insert new habits into our life without having too much you know, effort or whatever, or, or too much resistance. And then we're also going to go over um, a recent um, uh, article that Gigi and I found about how ch changing the, the gut bacteria in uh, autistic kids um, saw a huge reduction in autistic symptoms and, and all that. So, so I thought that was really fascinating. And, and, um, and it actually is kind of a, a piece to the puzzle when it comes to a lot of things that are going on with people in the recent, you know, 10, 20 years. Well, now I just want to talk about that article. <laughs> I have so much to say. Yeah, well, well, let's, let's, let's jump into the, the habit stacking thing. So habit stacking is where we all have our routines that we do every day. What, you know, like from the first time you wake up to getting out of bed and, and, you know, using the toilet and, you know, brushing your teeth and then taking a shower and, and then going to work, you know, there's always, you can, you can write all this stuff out. You can kind of lay out, you know, a section of a routine that is, that is consistent day to day. And, and uh, well, one of the ways you can insert a new habit into that is to um, be very specific with the habit and then do it, put it into your routine, insert it in between two things that you're already going to do, you know? So like flossing is a good analogy where, you know, you're going to wake up, and before you do anything else, you're going to pull out a piece of floss and put it on the counter, right? And, and it's ready for you. And then, uh, and then after you brush your teeth, you're staring at that floss this whole time. Now, if you don't floss your teeth, you have to throw the floss away. You can't save it for the next day. And so having it there and you're brushing your teeth and you're like, all right, I, I guess I need a floss, you know? So, so it's easy to put it in there because you put it in, you inserted it into the routine. It's a, it's a very specific uh, um, thing. And it's really good to start small when it comes to these sort of habits, when we're adding new, new habits. Um, it's always better to start small. And, and so that's kind of the concept of st habit stacking. Have you done anything like that before, Gigi? Literally my entire life is tricks, the ways that I trick myself into doing the things that I have to do. But so, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the difference between a routine and habit stacking because isn't that what a routine is it's just a bunch of good habits like all stacked together yeah definitely but i think i think you know most people there's routines that we just sort of have to do you know that we or that we default to and i think the idea is is instead of trying to you know build a whole new routine or add on some major big habit what, what he's saying is in, 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 is insert it into an existing routine. So if you try to put it before or after like a routine, um, it's easy to kind of skip because it's not, it's, it's not interrupting the, um, the pattern. Right. And so, so, yeah. Here's so it's like, idea. so you can't go on with your routine. Right. You're so used to doing unless you do this, this one thing. Um, so it's like, instead of having a laundry routine, what I do is I dump my clean laundry on my bed. So if I have to go to bed, if I have to, when I go to bed, <laughs> when I go to bed, I have to fold the fucking laundry. Otherwise I have to put the laundry back in the, in the hamper, which is so defeating. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like it's inserted into now into my bedtime routine instead of having like a whole separate like time to do laundry routine, which I could just avoid for weeks, you know, and just buy new clothes instead of washing, <laughs> which I, I did. Have a, I have a friend whose sister has been doing that and their, their house is literally piles of ones, like a hoarder, hoarder status. And, and, uh, where they, they have, they can't find their clothes and they're not clean. So they just go buy new ones with kids and stuff too. I'm like, what? Oh my God, with kids, that would just be a nightmare, right? Nightmare. Total fucking nightmare. Yeah. Crazy. Um, yeah. So yeah, I do that. You do that. What's your example? Um, well, like the flossing one is a good one for me for whatever reason. I just don't like flossing. I, so I, I remember I challenged myself to not break the chain, which is another habit, <laughs> habit, uh, technique. And I went like a year and a half without missing a day and, or I missed like 11 or 12 days or something like that. And then after that, I was kind of like, I did it. 
<laughs> I went back to not flossing. Challenge accepted and defeated, and now I'm never going to do it again. Yeah, so now I've gotten back. I got to get back to it. So now it's you know it was it was one of those, and that's and that's another you know sort of life lesson is sometimes when you set that goal, you know, got to remember what the real what was the real reason. I, and I want to keep my teeth because I plan on living a long life, and I don't want to have to have dentures or whatever. And so I really need to take care of these teeth. They got to last me another 40, 50 years. And so, so um, that, again? that was just such a really interesting mindset that you just kind of dropped there. Like I want to live a long life. And in order to do that, I don't want to have to wear dentures. Like you're, you're, you're basing your whole, like it's this incredible, like long-term thinking deal. Oh yeah. I try, I try to, I try to, I've been trying more and more to think really long-term, but you can tell I put a lot of thought into the fucking floss thing. <laughs> <laughs> trying to make myself do this and and um and well and, and the reality is is i is i haven't had a cavity in in like 15 or 20 years i don't i don't think uh no i haven't had any cavities and so you know i'm pretty good at taking care of my teeth i also eat i don't eat a lot of sugar or refined carbohydrates because i'm allergic to corn and gluten so like my diet's really dialed in and i take care of my teeth and so like it's not it's not immediately motivating me to to floss and except for there is the if you don't floss the the bone starts to recede right and then you end up getting looser and looser teeth so they measure it you know, they measure the depth and and uh, flossing helps uh, actually it can actually grow some back but it, but it'll prevent it the deterioration where eventually you lose your teeth so with receding gums not bone I guess it's gums but but uh, um yeah yeah so I was thinking like yeah I want to I want to have my these teeth need to last me another forty or fifty years like. I, and I smile a lot and I don't want to be all like, you know, <laughs> so, so that's motivate. So that's the real motivation. And I set this goal to not, you know, to not uh, mess up. And after going, it was like, you know, after basically three visits, I started it after when the dentist reminded me and then I made it six months and another six months and another six months. And then it was like, and I just felt like I was just over it. But so I didn't really build the habit. It was, it was, I was really just motivating myself to do it. And this is another really important thing when it comes to willpower and habits and motivation. Um, you know, the whole idea behind creating routines is things that we can, things that we do automatically. Anytime we go outside of our normal sort of routine of the day, it takes a little bit of extra thought, a little bit of extra energy, and that, and, and that willpower reserve can start to decrease. Now there's, there's been some more recent sort of studies and research that say that willpower isn't a depleted, you know, depleting resource. But I, I think that, um, for, for most people, it's a good analogy. They say, you know, when you wake up in the morning, your, your, your bank account of willpower is at a certain level. And, and the more you deplete that, the harder it's going to be if, if a challenge comes up. You know, if you have to work on some really tough project or you have to deal with a really uh, a real pain in the ass uh, coworker or something like that. Those, those, things, those things deplete your willpower even more. And then we tend to have less willpower to resist things, right? So one of the best uh, examples of this is... Uh, I think he talks about it in the habit loop or, or the power of the power of habit is the name of the book. And, and uh, you know, one of the stuff, and I think it was in thinking fast and slow with Daniel Kahneman, but, but uh, they basically had people sit in a room and watch this, the, this really sad scene from this movie terms of endearment where this mother's dying from cancer. And it's like, it's a real tear jerker. Well, the, the um, one group, they said, just watch, watch the scene, you know? And then they told the other group, they said, watch the scene, but like, don't show any emotion, just sort of like, just sit through this and try to control your, your emotions as much as you can. Well, most people, you know, most of the people were really choked up, if not crying outright, that were just told to sit there. The other group, they were fine. Like everybody could completely control themselves if they had to. But the real study was they had a bowl of M&Ms sitting next to them. And after, <laughs> after the person, they didn't mention it, after the person uh, left the room, they weighed the bowl of M&Ms to see how many M&Ms they ate. <laughs> And, and I can't remember the exact number, but it was like a huge amount more. If you had to control your emotions, which took more willpower, you ate more of the M&Ms because, because you're, you, you couldn't resist them. And there's some speculation that, that was, you know, represents glycogen and sugar, which is some, one of the things that powers our brain. So, you know, we want to eat, we want to eat to replenish that. And so it was, it's really interesting, you know, when you think about having to go to work and having to like, you know, pretend or not be yourself. Um, at least not punch people in the throat or say what you really want to say. Uh, <laughs> it takes a lot of willpower. And so, so when you think about the power of habit or routines is if we can establish these, these healthy, productive routines and habits that, that don't take any willpower, that allows us to continue to work on laying the groundwork and laying the foundation for new habits versus okay. if, if what? Keep going. 
Oh, I was just going to say, so, so the part of the premise of the book, and this is something that I teach a lot of people is, is, uh, uh we want to establish our routines. And then when, you know, the, for the will and anything that's willpower depleting, we want to try to remove it, you know, as much as we can. And then we have a little, you know, we, then we'll have a little reserve and then we use that to, to add new routines to our lives. You know, we use that little reserve that we have. And then after just one tiny little piece at a time, and then after time it becomes routine and then we can move on to something else. Go. So what is the difference between decision-making fatigue and willpower fatigue? Because in my mind, willpower is just decisions, right? It's do I or don't I? Yeah, no, it's, it, it's, it's pretty much, it's, they're very, they're very related. I don't really, I don't really know the science of, of how they would define the differences, but it, but it is, but, but again, the, the, the harder something is, you know, sometimes it's easy to make a quick decision, but the harder something is, the, um, the more defeating it can be. So, you know, one example is like commuting to work. If you have a really stressful commute because you're driving, and it's like, there's always people, you know, honking and cutting each other off. That, can, that already means you're setting yourself up for like a really tough day or, or it's going to be harder for you to make change. Maybe you can change your commute or, you know, take public transportation or whatever. But sometimes public transportation is a huge willpower depletion because you got smelly people and like people cutting their fingernails and doing all kinds of weird stuff. Um, and that could totally like mess you up, you know, and, and so sometimes it's good just to sit down and, and write this stuff down and figure out what is the things that are the most stressful for me and take the most willpower from me. And again, decisions, you're exactly right. People, people talk about, um, you know, big CEOs or people who are real big uh, entrepreneurs or sh movers and shakers. A lot of times they, they, they have the exact same clothes they wear like every day. It's like almost the exact same shirts and pants because they don't want to have to think. It's just they, just they don't have to think about what matches or how I want to look today that takes decisions. And it's like, I just want to put this on, you know? Yeah. It's just a routine, right? Yeah. So it's all, it all comes down to the more you can simplify stuff, the more you can do because the less you have to think about the day-to-day -day bullshit that goes on in your life, the more mental load is available, the more work capacity your brain can do to do anything else. Right? Like if, if I know what I'm making for dinner because I planned it ahead of time that day, like that literally takes so much that's a big thing for me like i like to have a nice like home cooked meal every night for me and my kids um but if i don't prep it and i don't have groceries for it or i don't have like something out of the freezer that's defrosting it i think about it all day and it's mm -hmm. this like probably takes up five percent of my mental capacity is to think about like okay i forgot to take something out i'm gonna have to stop on the way home to get something or if I don't have time to stop on the way home, now all of a sudden we're having pizza and it like it spirals out of control. It's like this whole thing. And it's all because I didn't follow my routine of taking something out of the freezer the night before. Yeah, food food is one of the biggest ones. And that's one of the ones most people struggle with. And and that's why I'm a big proponent of of uh, of having like a set, even like a set menu, you know, like you buy the same things at the grocery store and you kind of rotate through them and you just mix it up every once in a while. And we're, we definitely do that in our household. And I'd say we eat very clean compared to most people. And that was developed over time. And it's def it's delicious. But like there's, you know, there's five or six things that we eat on a regular basis and we make lots of leftovers. And that's fine. You know, like I eat eggs every day. Like that's just like I just fry up some eggs and, and uh, I might I'll do sriracha one day and I'll do tapatio the next day and I might do a little marinara the next day. And you know, it's just, it's just super basic. I don't mind it. I can eat it, I cook it, eat it fast. Um, and, but that, you know, that's me. And I don't, and like I said, it's something that I like, but if you can find those things, it's great. Cause you don't have to think about what am I going to eat today? You know, how, Oh, it's going to, you know, I didn't think of anything. Now I got to get something from the vending machine. Um, and so that's, that's taking some of that decision fatigue out of it. You know, yeah. I, I, I'd also like to say the same thing goes for coaching and programming. You know, like if you're trying to train yourself, um, you have to follow the program or you have to think about what you're going to do that day and how you're going to work out. And I do think there's this power to just showing up to class. So you can focus all of your energy to just getting to the gym and you know that that coach is going to take you through this routine and it's going to, and, and you're going to get a good workout in and you're going to move towards your goals and all that. Yeah. Um, you know, and when it comes to habit stacking, sorry, go ahead. I was just saying when it comes to habit stacking, you know, there's actually uh, the way I create the programming is we, you know, we start with some sort of dynamic warm up, um, and then and then a lot of the days we'll do um, some sort of mobility activation type work, and it's usually you know five minutes or so, and then and then skill and then strength. We don't do strength every day, but I put those at the top at the beginning of the routine 
And I insert those things because those are, those are three things that people need to work on. They need to work on their, their mobility and their activation. Is it great to do a lot of static stretching before like a heavy lift? No, it's not. So we actually want to work more on activation, but, but we know that if we wait till the end, people will cut out early. If we tell people to do it on their own, they won't do it. So I insert it into the routine so that people, you know, people come for the Metcon. They come for the endorphin rush they get after doing a hard Metcon. By inserting those things earlier on, people, um, you have to do it. You have to eat your vegetables first before you get to the dessert. And so, and so what we know is, is that, is that um, doing the mobility, doing the strength, and then some sort of skill work where you're practicing things uh, um, that, that may or may not go into Metcons, but are just good things for human, the human body to be able to do. Um, these are all really beneficial for people, but we gotta, we got to put them in early in the routine rather than trying to do it every once in a while or telling people to do it on their own. I like it. Cool. You want to talk about the article? Yeah, let's talk about, let's talk about the article. Um, uh, let me, sh let me see if I can share my screen. So <laughs> I should have opened this up with, we're going to talk about fecal transplants today. <laughs> you were talking about poop, taking your poop and putting it inside somebody else. Yeah. Which just sounds so weird. I heard about this years ago and there was actually somebody who, uh, he actually got a fecal transplant from uh, people in living traditionally in Africa, and and he was you know trying to see how that affected his his gut biome and his you know his health and everything and you know and one thing to point out is is uh, don't try this at home. <laughs> <laughs> Gross. With like a turkey baster or something. Um, um, they're and they're, they're they are they are trying to get this you know medically sound and so it's actually they're hitting a lot of roadblocks because of all the testing and everything, but. Um, but they, they've done it with, with animals and now they're doing human trials. And essentially what it is, is they use, they use some, some um, antibiotics or whatever to, to clear out a lot of your existing gut bacteria. And then they take the gut bacteria from a healthy person um, and, and then they transplant it, right? So it's, it's the, you know, it's, it's, it might sound, it sounds worse than it is, I think, but it's not as, it's not as intrusive as you might, as you might think. So um, just to kind of put a little bit more background on it, there's, there's bacteria throughout your gut system, right? So your digestive system basically runs right from your mouth all the way to your butt. And there is billions of gut biota, like little bacteria that live there. And there are more, there are more uh, um, cells of, of bacteria than cells in your entire body. And I think yeah. there's more cells than stars and that we've mapped. Yeah. Crazy. So, um, so the thing is, though, is that like the different bacteria will thrive in different environments. So what a, what a healthy uh, like gut back biota, we call it like the gut flora, um, what it is in your stomach is very different than what it is in your small intestine is very different than what it is in your large intestine. Um, but what happens is that things like antibiotics or probiotics, prebiotics, postbiotics, I don't know, <laughs> all of those things they will only like it'll clean out your entire digestive system right so a prebiotic that benefits bacteria that's in your small intestine might actually be a bad bacteria in your large intestine so it throws off the balance right so your your digestive system is very sensitive to this little civilization that lives inside of it and you know one is supposed to populate in one area and the other is supposed to populate in another area and when they get out of balance or go in a place where they don't belong that's when you start to get problems. And that's on top of external bacteria being added in. So that's not even including like salmonella or like any of those other bacterium that also throw off the thing. So the reason that fecal transplants are so effective when compared to all of the other types of um, bacterial treatments is because they're going directly to that portion, right? So it's directly into the large intestine as opposed to having to go through, like if you can imagine if, when you take a pill, it's got to go through your entire digestive system and like go through every other civilization along the way before it gets to the area that it's supposed to be affecting. So basically going in the other side helps with like targeting that specific bacterium and specifically adjusting the, the balance of the population for that specific civilization, that specific area. So yeah. That's why it's well. And why this is why this is interesting, especially with the uh, um, with regards to autism and the spectrum. The um, what they're learning more and more is that our gut really there really is a gut brain connection. You know, people talk about having a gut feeling and everything like that. If you took all the neurons and when the neurons are the cells in your brain that kind of make up who you are, 
if you took all the neurons out of your your gut system, it would be the size of a cat brain. <laughs> like there there are actually a significant number of neurons in in our guts, and and uh, and so this will affect mood, and it'll affect uh, um, you know uh, certain certain cognitive diseases and things. And there was actually another interesting study I saw right after this that said um, removing the appendix. Um, showed a 25% decrease in, in uh, Parkinson's disease. So, so Parkinson's disease is a, a, you know, it has to do with an autoimmune disease where, where the body kind of attacks parts of the brain, the myelin sheath in the brain, and it, you know, it causes problems with the dopamine uh, receptors and everything. But, but, uh, but again, it's like, oh, wait, so the appendix is this little tiny, it's kind of like a, like a cul-de-sac or a dead end street on this long chain of, of intestine. And, you know, we, you know, people will, if that gets infected and swollen, cause you know, maybe bad bacteria got in there, or whatever, it could be trauma. Um, uh, then they remove it and, and they you know, they feel like, Oh, we don't really need it anymore. Well, the speculation is, is that that was kind of like the, the, the storage compartment for your gut bacteria. So if you did get some, you know, thousands of years ago, if you did get some sort of infection or something that kind of flushed you out, you would, you would have a little reserve to then repopulate your gut. And, and so it's really fascinating to, to, to hear that, okay, well, if people have that removed, um, that changes the dynamic and it actually prevented Parkinson's. That doesn't mean that we're going to tell people to get their appendix removed um, <laughs> to prevent Parkinson's disease, but it does, again, create that link between the gut health, you know, autoimmune issues uh, and, and, and cognitive stuff. There is, there's so much on that. Like some research has even gone on, some researchers have even gone on record to say that um, the gut is actually like a sixth sense um, in, and, and it can also like affect your brain, your emotions, your hormones, everything. And it's so powerful. Um, and if you want to know more about that, uh, we talk a lot about it on one of my other shows, the fitness experiment. Um, we could go really down that route, but why don't we get to the, the study and the ASD and, and everything like that and kind of, yeah. So, so what the study said was um, uh, this uh, fecal transplant therapy in kids reduced their autism severity by 47%. And one thing I do want to point out, it wasn't a large study, um, but what was really fascinating was um, it was, it, I think it was only about 20 kids or 17 kids or something like that. And they all were on the kind of extreme side. They were, um, uh, they were, I'm trying to see where, where it said it here. 83 kids. Oh, it was 83. Oh, okay. Um, but I think they were selected for having extreme, extreme uh, autism Weird. symptoms on, on their, Weird. on their, yeah, on the scale. And, and so they, you know, they saw immediate changes. They did see some changes immediately and they thought, wow, this is really interesting. And then they decided to reach out to those people two years later. And what they found was many of the kids, if not all of them had seen improvements um, even beyond the initial improvements. So they continued to improve and some of them moved off the scale completely. Yeah. So they actually, you, know, you don't want to say they it cured it, but, it, but um, from when it comes to the, to the scale they were using, they actually moved off it completely just through this, this procedure. And so by changing the gut. Now, what I suspect was the ones that we saw the most success with, they probably continued to eat a healthier diet. So the, a healthy diet in and of itself will promote a healthy gut. And I think that, you know, and kind of the, the link that I'm seeing is with this you know, the, the increasing rates of, of autism spectrum, uh, in, in society, it's not, it's not the, uh, it's not the vaccines or whatever, but it probably is connected to our poor diets. Right. And this lack of understanding of, of gut health. Is that, is that the link that you're seeing or is that the link that I suggested before the show? No, like, no, that's, that was definitely what I was thinking when, <laughs> when I, when I saw that. Um, uh, so just to be clear, like, like ASD is a neurological condition. It will never fully go away. It's just the way their brains operate. Like I'm dyslexic. My brain operates a certain way. ASD people, their brain operates a certain way, but there are ways like, like I know, like living with dyslexia, there are ways that will trigger it. There are things that I can do that will make it worse or make it better. And ASD is no different. Right. And so now what JJ was getting at is that like, when we, ever, we have so many mental health issues more than we ever have. We have more ASD than we ever have. We have more gut bacteria issues, things like Crohn's disease and IBS and colitis and, 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 mm -hmm. because our diets are so fucking shitty. And 
one of the one of the best ways to do research um like this is from like a critical thinking perspective when you analyze the extremes of the situation oftentimes will give you insights on correlation and causalities that you can't detect on a day-to-day -day level like if if a if a person who doesn't have a neurological condition um cuts out sugar they would indicate that they feel better right like just in general like i feel a little bit better you know what i mean like they might not need to lose any weight or they might not like but but the improvements happen on such a small scale that it's like yeah, i cut out sugar and now i feel good and i had a piece of cake and i don't feel bad but if you added sugar in every single day and had a piece of cake every day you might start to feel bad but you're not gonna it's not as profound or extreme as this particular case and so the really cool thing about this case is that this is an extreme you're studying a niche group that exists on an extreme end and had these extreme results and now we can take that and we can say okay so if a if a person with a neurological condition has improvements on their symptoms after fixing their gut bacteria how could that help like an everyday person because it's not like only people with asd have this brain gut connection mm -hmm. right like clearly all of us do but it's so obvious when you look at extreme cases right so these studies are so important yeah so this was it was 18 kids between age 7 and 16 um, compared to 20 control subjects and uh the the follow-up was uh 83% of the initial test group could be considered as severe on the autistic spectrum. Two years later, that was just 17%. Um, amazingly, 44% no longer made the cutoff for, uh, for being on the mild end of the spectrum at all. And, and uh, one thing, you know, one thing I do want to say, like you, like you said it, like autism is, is not a, is not a curable disease. That's not really what, that's not really how it works when it should be trying to cure autism or it's just, a, it's people, they're different. Right. And, and they actually, a lot of people who are on the autism spectrum, like do amazing things um, for society and it could be considered a, you know, a benefit. So we don't necessarily want to talk about that, but if we could reduce symptoms and make their lives easier, you know, uh, using a, using a procedure, a one-time procedure that has benefits for years, um, that's huge. And, and again, what we learn from this is again, maybe, you know, they are doing some research I know for like obesity and things where they're taking, they, and I remember seeing a study or it was a, it was a case I should say, of a girl who, um, you know, had some major um, she, uh, uh, weight problem, but she got, she, I think she got some sort of bug or whatever, and, you know, she had to be, have, it, have her gut repopulated. Well, they, they found, they have found a donor, it was a friend or whatever, who actually happened to be very thin, and they gave her the, the, uh, the new bacteria, and her, and she lost all the body weight, all the body fat, and fit and leaned way out. And it was, now what's complicated about this, and, and this is something we should point out, is there are so many different kinds of gut bacteria, like we can't even, like mapping it like we map the genome is, is almost impossible. Like we're not there yet. It'll, it's gonna take a very long time to determine which, which bacteria are beneficial for who and how it plays with our genes. It's super complicated. So this, this is kind of this, this huge, this whopping approach of just taking an entire hum, you know, human's entire uh, sample and giving it to someone else. It's not like we can, and this is the problem with taking a lot of, a lot of probiotics. You know, they'll be like, oh, it, it has these 10 different bacteria that they've cultured and grown. It's like, okay, 10 out of how many you know, different strains there are in our guts. Well, the other thing too, is that if the bad bacteria is absorbing all the resources, then the yeah. good bacteria never even has a chance, right? So like if you're, you're putting it in your system and there's no, there's no resources, so there's no food or oxygen that's available there to compete with because the bad bacteria is so out of control, then you will never change that, right? You have to simultaneously like decrease the bad bacteria as well as increase the good bacteria. So, and like, and you could be, you could try like, and you know, I, you've seen this happen as much as I have, right? Where you, you know, someone who has been trying to lose weight and they're, they're doing everything right. They're working out and they're eating clean and it's just not happening. And then they start to change their sleep and they get their stress under control. And this actually happened to my sister. So she, she struggled with this her entire life. And then it turns out that this whole problem stems from that she has too much uh, estrogen in her system, which as I'm, I don't know, is this a common knowledge thing? So estrogen causes like fat retention, right? Is that a normal, do normal people know that? <laughs> well, they do now. <laughs> <laughs> they do now. So if you have a lot of estrogen in your system, male or female can have estrogen, male or female can have testosterone. Um, 
And if that balance between estrogen and testosterone is off and you have too much estrogen, you will hold, your body will hold on to fat because it wants that body fat to protect it and to do the things that you need to do with estrogen. So, um, so it turns out that she has this like proliferation of this bacteria in her gut that creates an enzyme that prevents the binding of estrogen. So basically estrogen is supposed to be absorbed. Um, like it's supposed to be bound in your gut and then excreted when you have extra, that's how your body cleans out anything that's extra, right? Keeps everything in balance. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So this particular bacteria likes the estrogen. So it releases an enzyme that prevents the binding of the estrogen. So the estrogen instead just gets recycled in your system. So your body's still creating the natural estrogen, but it's bastards. <laughs> right? So it's this like constant battle. And it's like, that's something that literally, if you never cleared out that bacteria, it doesn't matter what the fuck else you're doing in your life. It doesn't matter how healthy you are because that problem will literally never ever go away. If you don't simultaneously kill that bacteria and in, and put in new healthy bacteria. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the case for that, that study that you were talking about. Right. Like I'm sure it was something very similar to that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting that, cause so, so one of the, one of the things that everyone should understand is that the bacteria in your gut, you know, they, they take, um, you know, stuff that's coming by, whether it's, whether it's food or fiber or whatever, and then they'll break that down and they produce enzymes, they produce other chemicals that then absorb into our body and again, affect our moods, affect, affect our weight loss and everything. So, you know, having the right little machines in there producing the right outputs is really important for health and happiness, right? And so um, the more we, the more they research they do, the more they can find out. And it would be great to have like a, a, a pill that you could take or a stack of a hundred different things that are gonna promote the healthy stuff. And I think we're moving that direction. But as of right now, like there's been a lot of research that says like, like kombucha and, and, and a lot of probiotics could actually be negative, you know, actually could be a net negative. Um, and so I'm sure right now everyone's wondering, like, okay, what, well, what do I do? How do I change my, my gut bacteria? So what are some of the things that, that you recommend? Well, some of the things are number one, sugar. So good bacteria don't feed off of sugar. They feed off of other stuff. Bad bacteria thrives on sugar. So any bacteria that thrives um, in a glucose environment is typically not healthy for you. Um, and if you look historically, humans didn't really eat a lot of glucose until very recently. Um, so historically, the bacteria types that we evolved with didn't didn't need glucose so by introducing like really high glucose it's thrown off the balance right because now the bad bacteria is allowed to proliferate um, and again a lot of these bacteria are are there and are present and you do need them but you need them in the right balance right so having a healthy diet with like all your rainbow vegetables right so like purples and yellows and greens and when you're grocery shopping you should always just look at your cart and make sure you've got every color in there and over the course of two weeks if you eat every color you're doing really well right? So that's a really good thing. Um, rainbow vegetables and fruits and no added sugars, nothing. Yeah. No sugar also is also linked to cancer too, right? Yeah. Most cancer cells. Which so again, like, the bacteria imbalance they're finding now too, right? Yeah. And yeah. I really like apple cider vinegar as like a, like a prebiotic. It does other really good things for you. So when you're talking about stack, um, habit stacking, actually one of the things that I was going to say is that I now keep a shot glass in my cupboard right next to my apple cider vinegar. So when I make, when I prep my coffee for the next morning, it's right there and the shot glass is right there. So I'm like, oh, okay, now I got to take a shot of apple cider vinegar. So it's one of the things that I've incorporated into my life to kind of just help. And um, it, apple cider vinegar does help with a lot of other really good things too. So I would suggest adding that in. But like you said, don't run out and buy a whole bunch of fermented food or prebiotics and probiotics and stuff because that, hasn't necessarily been proved to cause well again i think i think like with the um kind of the the warning with it comes to kombucha is is that again it's they're they're trying to produce it as cheaply as possible um you know within reason and so they're you know they have some bacteria that they've deliberately put in there there's going to be other bacteria that just sort of came along with the process um and it shouldn't be like your go-to necessarily like it's great to enjoy it and i think i think having fermented foods like kombucha sauerkraut kimchi um, tempa and, and those sort of things, those traditionally fermented foods are actually good to help because they do kind of change things up and they, they do promote, you know, having good, good bacteria in your gut. Um, 
you know, from a fermented food standpoint, I think part of what's going on, and this is just speculation on my part, I haven't, I haven't looked this up, but um, a lot of times the, 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 in the fermentation process, the, a lot of the, the, the um, bacteria there are going to digest a lot of the sugars and things. And so when, they, when you take that bacteria and put it in, you know, like they're, they're a different type of bacteria. And maybe we don't want those bacteria because they're a sugar preferring one. And, um, or maybe, you know, maybe we do. And so that's, that's kind of where, where things get kind of complicated. Um, taking probiotic pills, um, you know, there's, there's been mixed results with that. Um, I actually recommend, uh, um, I do take a probiotic, but I change it up. So I, I, I rotate through different brands and different strands to, to make sure that I'm not just taking the same one all the time. Um, but then there's also a lot of um, prebiotics, which is fiber, which is, which is foods that, that um, feed the bacteria. So it's not just the bacteria pill itself, but actually things that feed the bacteria. Um, and uh, one of the ones that I've, I've experimented with off and on um, over the years was um, resistant starch. Yeah. Um, and so you can get plantain, dried plantain starch, super cheap. You can also get potato starch at the grocery store. Um, and and uh, the potato starch and the plantain starches, um, you don't digest. So you don't get any calories from those things when you, when you eat them. Uh, basically, it's raw, raw plantain starch. But it feeds the, the gut bacteria. And it made me have crazy dreams. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of cool. I, like, I was like, oh, I can't wait to see what I dream, dream about tonight. Um, but, uh, but yeah. And so, and so, uh, I go, you know, I said, I, I go off and on with, with that stuff. I've also done a holistic protocol where I took a bunch of, um, uh, uh, basically antibiotics. It was, it was, uh, garlic oil and oregano oil, which has shown to kill off a lot of bad bacteria and bacteria in general for so many weeks. And then I re reintroduced it. I didn't see a big change personally, but as somebody who has had gut issues for most of my life that, that I was, it was worth a shot. Um, but I have not seen a naturopath or, or a functional medicine doctor to, to, to work that stuff out. I probably should. <laughs> yeah. And that, I mean, ultimately, like if you think that this might be something that you are struggling with, go see a naturopath. They can get all the tests done that you need to. They can kind of align up your symptoms. They can give you better, better advice than, than we can because we're not doctors. Right. But, but you know. <laughs> speak for yourself. No, I'm just kidding. You're not, you're an engineer, not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so I, yeah, I would definitely talk to an expert if you're struggling with these things, but in general, if, even if you don't think that you have too many issues with it, it's still good to, again, in your routines, put in things that like apple cider vinegar or taking prebiotics and you guys, that's, that stuff is, is basically free when you compare it to regular supplements. It's so cheap, um, compared to taking, you know, pills that cost 50 cents or a dollar a pill, um, yeah. for, that are, that are, you know, actual probiotics, um, those things over time. And then like I said, remo removing, or like you said, removing sugar and adding, just making sure you're getting the vegetables. Vegetables are full of fiber. And that's yeah. one of the things that feed the good bacteria. And uh, the, you'll be on your way to, to, to having a healthier gut and, a, and, and feeling better and everything else. So it's, it goes beyond just, just the, oh, I'm eating a healthy diet. I feel better because I'm eating a healthy diet. It's like, no, it's literally changing your gut bacteria and that makes you feel better. Yeah. Yeah. You literally, you, you physiologically feel better and you mentally and emotionally feel better because you just there's nothing that's making you feel bad there's nothing that's throwing off that balance and like you should be happy most people are happy you will not that's totally incorrect but you should be we should be happy we shouldn't be sad and upset and struggling all the time and if you are then something is probably off and and my guess is that once upon a time when we were a lot more in touch with our emotions and things like that if someone was having like episodes people would be like, dude, like you're not eating well, like something's wrong, like you're sick, right? And we're, we're only now coming back to it where it's like you have a mental illness. It's an illness, which means that something is wrong, which means you can get better, right? So now we're going to get carried away, so we should probably just wrap this up. <laughs> we'll wrap it up here. So thanks, everybody, for joining us again. Think about, again, think about one small, tiny, minuscule habit that you could insert into your routine. Like I said, it could be something like flossing or, or – uh, uh, drinking your apple cider vinegar. It could be um, doing more mobility. You know, you, you do, you do a few minutes of working on that bum shoulder or stretching your, your you know, working on your hips. So your knee stops hurting. Um, insert that where it's just a couple minutes a day, put it into, into a routine that, that is, that is, you know, going to work like clockwork. And then, and then once it becomes part of the routine, 
move on to something else, you know, and, and I'll post a link to the article from James Clear that I, that we talked about today. So you guys can check it out. He's got some great resources on how to write it out and kind of other, other ideas on how to implement this stuff and uh, check out his book, Atomic Habits. Good stuff. Love it. All right. Thanks guys. We will uh, see you in the next video or podcast. Bye. <laughs>